Today we celebrate the life of the greatest Scot. Come on a journey through the life of Robert Burns. Robert Burns was born on the 25th of January 1759 in a clay biggin in Alloway, Ayrshire. The eldest son to William and Agnes Burness. He died on the 21st of July 1796 in a respectable townhouse in Dumfries. The 37 years in between were years of hard work and hard luck, of genius and ultimately immortality. Robert's father, William Burness, was born in the Mairns, in an area just near Aberdeen. William and his brothers moved south to Edinburgh after the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. There they gained work as gardeners. William was instrumental in designing and building the meadows, a large grassy area within the centre of Edinburgh. However, work in Edinburgh soon dried up and William left his brothers and journeyed to Ayrshire. Here he took up work with the local estates, working as a head gardener and for some of the local landlords. He also had a post in various villages as a market gardener and whilst working in one village, Maybole, met Agnes Brown. The pair soon fell in love. In 1757, William and Agnes were married. William began construction of a cottage in the village of Alloway, a small village just south of the town of Ayr. It is this cottage in which Robert was born in 1759. The cottage now forms part of the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum. This museum takes place, it's situated over three sites, the cottage, Alloway Kirkyard and the local gardens across from the Kirkyard and a large state-of-the-art interactive museum which details much aspects of Robert Burns's life in Ayrshire. In this simple three-room cottage, the first five of the Burns children were born. Gilbert Burns was born in 1760. Agnes Burns born in 1762. Arabella Burns born in 1764. And William Burns born in 1767. Of course, these four being preceded by Robert Burns himself, born in 1759. The cottage had three rooms. The first two rooms forming one part of the cottage were the living area, the kitchen and the bedroom where the family congregated for most of the day. The second room was the spence or the main living room. Here was only used when guests visited the house. The other part of the cottage consisted of a buyer and feed store where the animals and the animal feed were kept. The, room, the house itself had no chimneys. These later being added by a, a subsequent tenant. The house had a couple of windows. It was cold, it was dark and it was smoky, smoky in the winter. At this cottage, Robert began to take an interest in reading. He loved to hear the stories his mother told and the ones read to him by his father. He also listened intently as his aunt Betty told him stories of ghosts and witches, warlocks and devils, elves and other such supernatural stories. He kept these in his head and they would come back to make him famous later in his life. When Robert was seven, the family moved from Alloway to a farm called Mount Oliphant. Here they worked hard. They worked hard to grow and to harvest crops and to look after the animals that lived on the farm. Robert's two younger siblings were born at Mount Oliphant. 
John Burns born in 1769. And finally, Isabella, born in 1771. The Burns family was complete. The whole of the Burns family worked around the farm. They also helped in other farms in the area. And in working one such farm, bringing the harvest, the 15-year-old Robert Burns met Nelly Kilpatrick and he fell wholehearted in love with her. He then, in his own words, committed the sin of rhyme and for the 14-year-old Nelly, Burns wrote, Handsome Nell, O oh, once I loved a bonny lass and I love her still, and whilst that virtue warms my breast, I love my handsome Nell. From then on, Burns was hooked in poetry, on life and on love. He wrote poems on all aspects of the life that he found around about him. Poems like The Two Dogs, Addressed to the Toothache, To a Mouse, Addressed to a Haggis, Holy Willie's Prayer, A Quarter Saturday Night, and many, many more. Robert's father, after many years of hard toil, having moved the family from Mount Oliphant to Loch Lye Farm, decided that they had to move again. Loch Lye had been an abject failure. They moved to the village of Mochlin, to a farm called Mosgiel. Here, he hoped the family would have a better start. Robert and Gilbert, now being grown men, formed a club with their friends, the Turbolton Bachelors Club. There they met to debate the events of the day, to have a drink, to talk about women, and to learn to dance. Burns loved the camaraderie of the club, and it formed many friendships that lasted him throughout his life. When Robert was 24, his father passed away, worn out by the legal wranglings over the farm at Loch Lee and the hard work at Mosgiel. Robert was made head of the family, a very poor family. Burns decided that as head of the family, it's his responsibility to look after them, but also to get married. He started to go into dances in the village of Mosgiel, and at one of the dances he met the woman who had become the love of his life, his Bonnie Jean. Jean Armour was the daughter of James Armour, a very important man in the town, a local stonemason. And when Burns sought permission from Armour to marry Jean, this was utterly rejected. Burns was heartbroken, Jean was heartbroken, and Jean was sent away to the far distant Paisley to live with one of her aunts. Burns was angry. Burns was sad. Burns was fed up. Burns wanted out of farming. He wanted out of Scotland. He sold his share of the farm to Gilbert and decided that his future lie lay across the Atlantic Ocean in Jamaica. Burns wanted to work on a sugarcane plantation to look after and dry to look after and manage the slaves on that plantation. Burns would later go on to decry slavery and decry the harsh treatment of people who wanted to become a slave driver. What a difference it would have made if Burns had made it to Jamaica. We wouldn't have had any songs of mouses nests being turned out. We'd have had no Holy Willy. We'd have had no Tama Shanta. Wow, what a difference that would have made. To finance his voyage, Burns was persuaded by some of his friends to write his poems down in a book. Burns didn't think that was a good idea, but he looked for every opportunity. Burns wrote the book, poems chiefly in a Scottish dialect. The book was published in 1786. It was an instant and widespread success. The book was sold for two shillings. 612 copies were made and they sold out in a matter of weeks. Burns realised that life in Jamaica 
was not for him. His poems were selling. He wanted to stay in Scotland and become a writer. He was persuaded by Dr Blacklock that perhaps he should travel to Edinburgh there to write a second volume of his poems. So Burns turned his horse and headed to the capital. Here he engaged in the high life. He enjoyed the partying. He enjoyed the camaraderie of being amongst the rich and he enjoyed the company of the ladies. Here he met Nancy McElhose. Nancy's husband had left her and gone to the West Indies to seek his fortune. Burns fell in love with Nancy, but she was unattainable. She was far too rich for Burns. They carried on a love affair by correspondence only. No physical love between Clarinda or Sylvander. She stole Burns's harp. The fling between Nancy and Robert in Edinburgh was really only a fling. His heart lay with Jean Armour. Burns got a letter from his friend Gavin Hamilton saying that James Armour had now agreed that Burns and Jean could be married. Robert left Edinburgh. Before doing so, he met up with Nancy one last time and he wrote for her the greatest love song ever written, A Fond Kiss. Burns wrote many love songs in his life, but none capture the essence of love so much as this great song. On their return from Edinburgh, Robert and Jean were married and they moved to take up residence and the tenancy at Ellerslund Farm on the banks of the Nith. Here, the family began to grow and Robert began to write less and work more. He had taken a job with the excise, riding around Nithdale County, seven days a week, collecting taxes, collecting revenue, all for a salary of £50 a year, from which he had to buy his horse, his gun and his uniform. He lost the time and the inspiration for writing. As I said, his family began to grow at Ellisland Farm. His children were Elizabeth Payton, Robert and Jean Burns, twin girls who died at birth and were never named, Francis Burns, Elizabeth Park Burns, William Nicol Burns, Elizabeth Riddell Burns and James Glen Cairn Burns. Whilst working at Ellisland, Burns was persuaded by Francis Gross to write a poem which would accompany a picture that was being included in Gross's book, The Antiquities of Scotland. Gross had chosen Alloway Kirk. Burns went for a wander around the, chart, the farm and as he wandered trying to get ideas he remembered the stories that his aunt had told him about ghosts and witches and devils and he began to formulate a plan. Jean often told friends how Burns would chuckle to himself as he wandered around the farmyard, writing down his ideas for what became become his most famous poem. The poem was of course Tam O'Shanter, the story of a man's escape from witches and wizards and warlocks after having enjoyed a night on the tiles with his pals. This poem is 229 lines long. Poetic genius described by some as the highest pinnacle of poetry anywhere in the world. Tamashanta is a favourite poem of most Burns readers. Working on the excise left Burns little time for farming and the farm began to fail. He sold up and moved the family 
to Dumfries, to a poor part of the town. But not long late after this, he moved the family to a respectable house on Millbrae. Here the family would live and Burns would spend the remainder of his life. He continued to write, but this time on his songs. He thought that collecting and rescuing songs and writing songs was the most important thing that he could do. He sung songs about life. He wrote songs about friendship, about memories, about love, about animals. He was a chief contributor to the Scots musical miscellany. His famous songs include My Love Is Like A Red Red Rose, the aforementioned Day Fond Kiss, A Man's A Man For All That, Green Grow The Rashes O, Killy Cranky, Ye Banks And Braes Of Bonnie Doon, and the global anthem that is a for Auld Lang Syne. Auld Lang Syne is Auld Lang Syne is a global anthem. It is sung in all parts of the world, from Blantyre to Brisbane, from Hamilton to Lai, from Larkhall to Lagosh. In Japan, school children sing this song at the beginning of the date school day, and shops and factories play it at the end of the working day to let people know it's time to go home to their families. In Russia, children recite it every day. When the Scottish Parliament was opened, this song was chosen as the anthem for the opening of the Parliament. Burns wrote this song about friendship, about love, about memories, and about those we leave that. Them that the only cure was to stand shoulder deep in the seawater at Brow Well. This cure did not make him any better. In fact, it hastened him to an early grave. On the 21st of July 1796, he died in the upstairs bedroom of the family home. The town of them freeze went into mourning. He was buried in the northeast corner of St Michael's churchyard, a funeral attended by over 10,000 people. Such a fitting place for a man as Robert Burns. He never fought a battle. He never discovered a great cure. But Burns left as a legacy, a legacy which has made him immortal. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to charge your glasses and join with me in toasting the immortal memory of Robert Burns. His doctor prescribed daily bathing in the brow well near Dumfries. Burns would stand for hours shoulder deep in cold seawater. This cure did not help Robert Burns. It hastened him to his early grave. On the 21st of July 1796, Robert Burns died in the upstairs bedroom of the family home in Millbrae. He was buried in the northeast corner of St Michael's Churchyard in Dumfries, a fitting place for such a man as Robert Burns. 10,000 people attended his funeral. The only person not there was his wife Jean, she giving birth to her son Maxwell on that day.